Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not a bad welcome, it's is a it? Welcome. Sir Lenny Henry. Uh, the black people say, Yeah, Len, we love you, but I'm going to check Whitney again. <laughs> We've seen that on telly, Len. <laughs> yeah, we're off to We enjoy week. your chat with you. <laughs> It's going to be a really short interview because June's got to see the Whitney film. Yeah, so I'm like counting down. It's going to be a really long Q&A. <laughs> we were saying before this started, we were saying, I was like, Lenny, actually, he, Lenny was like, you know what, don't worry, June, if you want me to ask myself questions so you can go watch Whitney, that's fine. <laughs> I walked in there, she was going, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll always love you. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm June Sarpong, and I am the lucky person uh, who gets to spend the next hour interviewing the one and only Sir Lenny Henry. You gave him such a warm welcome. Uh, I think, should we just give him another one, just to make him feel loved? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, so, what do I call you? Do I call you Lenny or Sir Lenny? How does this work? What, um, what do you like? What do you want, Len? Lenny. What if you want to call I'm going to call you My family just call me Len. <laughs> Len? <laughs> Len? Like that, usually. Well, I, you know what? I, I tell you what. I'm going to call you Lenny in the comedy moments and then Sir Lenny in the serious stuff. Um, so now your career has spanned over four decades. Obviously, you started when you were two years old, yes. um, darling. Um, uh, what's really interesting about your first break was you were almost like the original reality star, weren't you? Uh. Well, I was, on a, I was on a television uh, talent show called New Faces, mm. which was very popular in the 70s. Um, a little bit like Britain's Got Talent in that uh, you could be a professional or you could be unprofessional yeah. uh, with huge viewing figures that regularly would get between 10 and 16 million viewers. Which was so, standard then. Which was standard on only three channels. So people didn't have anything else to watch, you know. So... Um, I, I was on and seen by 16 million people with my debut performance and basically never stopped work for 10 years. Um, it was an uh, extraordinary start. Um, How old were you? Then? I was 16. Oh my goodness. So I auditioned when I was 15. And it had, leading up to that, there had been a, a period of time from school through to my early teens of going out to clubs and things, of entertaining my friends and realising that I could do this thing. I could make them laugh, I could do impersonations, I could tell stupid jokes that I'd heard off the television, and I could make it sort of coherent. Mm. And um, I was seen by a DJ doing this at the Queen Mary Ballroom in Dudley. Of course, They'd stop the disco. <laughs> they stopped the disco and allowed me to perform for 10 minutes. Oh. And this DJ said, you should be on the telly. And he wrote away to two talent shows, New Faces and Opportunity Knocks. And Opportunity Knox still haven't written back to this day. <laughs> well, that's gone. You're still here, and so exactly. we know who did it. And <laughs> you faces said, a young black impressionist, we want to see that. Yeah. And so later on that year, I went, I bunked off school and uh, I, wore my, I wore my Sunday school clothes and I went to this audition. I waited all day. And interestingly, now, there have been a documentary film crew making the film of my day of course waiting to be auditioned and yeah. finding out who I was and where I was from but the, Tears. just sat there all day waiting with nobody talking to me except for the DJ who kept saying you know now do you remember your jokes <laughs> and um, then I went on stage and I did people were basically being told next after two minutes and I was allowed to do 15 minutes wow. and I just I ran out of stuff eventually and was just making stuff up and in the end, I was told that I'd passed with flying colours and that I was going to be on TV in January, so get ready. Wow. And it was a, an amazing launch. Can I ask what your parents said? Because obviously, you know, you're from a, a Caribbean background and the, the sort of the first wave of immigrants, the thing that mattered most to them was education. So I can imagine your mother wasn't too impressed. Well, because I bunked off school for the whole day <laughs> and I didn't get back home. Lenny! <laughs> There was all that. I arrived back at six o'clock. She was waiting. She was by the door like this. And I wasn't allowed to go in the house. And it was, where do you think you've been? And I said, oh, before audition, audition for what? And uh, she basically made me do the whole thing on the front doorstep. Before, before you could go in the so house. So all I can smell is soup in the house. 
and I can't go in the house because my mum is in the... Yes, you're not getting any soup till you do the whole thing. Start with Tommy Cooper and work your way to the end. So I did... I did oh, thank you very much. You may have seen some of these impressions before. This is on the doorstep, people are, hello, Mrs. Henry. You're making Lendu's audition. And so I did the whole thing and then she let me in. And she actually, give her fair play, she did laugh. Mm. And then after that, she would come and see me do shows. Oh, good. So... Um, and she was fantastic when she came to see shows because you've got to remember, in the clubs like the Night Out in Birmingham or Jolly's in Stoke or the Golden Garter in Manchester, it was a predominantly white audience. There were very rarely black people in those places, um, particularly when Bernard Manning was on. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so the, the night I was at the Night Out... Um, Tommy Cooper had just disappeared. Mm. I think he was on a bender or something. And they rang the house and said, could Lady Henry come down and do... Uh, the, could Tommy Cooper isn't on. So I went down and they paid me a lot of money. And I went on stage and my mum decided she would come with my brother Hilton, my brother Seymour, my sister Kay, and uh, my brother Paul. And all he could hear was this. <laughs> <laughs> the black people when nobody the else was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> He's as good as Jimmy Tarbuck. <laughs> That's, that's what you heard for the whole thing. Oh, nothing like some But she was brilliant. Love. You just, you know. <laughs> but she was really strict. And, she, and there were many, many times, particularly in the first 10 years, when I wanted mm. to give up, when I just didn't understand what was required of me. Mm. And I think that um, the whole 10,000 hours thing that Malcolm Gladwell Talked wrote about, about is yes. fascinating. Yeah. Because it probably does take you 10 years to get halfway decent yes. at something. Yes, yeah. To get where you're proficient. You know, by the time I got to 1985, I could sort of go anywhere and do a show that would make the audience laugh, laugh. and make them happy. But leading up to that was very, very difficult. So in the moments where you felt like giving up, yeah, she it would was say, your mother that said no way. Yeah, she'd just say, this is your life now. You've given, you gave up on your apprenticeship. You gave up on your education. This is what you plump for. You're going to see it through. You make your bed, you better lie down on it. Lie on it. Anyway, we've got a great clip uh, of have the you? early days. Yeah, should we have a look? Okay. That suit. That's an Anthony Price suit, and it cost more than um, what they paid the writers for the whole series. Oh, my goodness, really? I, I kept saying, he should have an Anthony Price suit. I didn't know who Anthony Price Delbert was. Delbert would, though, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, Delbert, I mean, he <clears throat> really was, for me, growing up, he was like the character of my childhood. How did you come up with him? I was watching the Brixton riots on television, and I saw Paul Boateng foaming at the mouth. He was so angry, mm. and he couldn't, he couldn't get his point of view across because he was so angry. And I just said, they should have one of the young people there talking about what their feelings are yeah. about their, their so town being on fire. Yeah. You know, there must be somebody cool who can talk about you know, their relationship with the police. And as I started to think about it, I thought, well, it should be, it should be a wide boy. He should mm. be on the black economy. He should yeah. look good. He should be a DJ. He should be... And suddenly, Delbert's came to life, pretty much fully formed. And it took a lot of getting right. We did the... There was a lot of dodginess about him. He was a bit of a black Del Boy at the beginning. Mm. But as he developed, he became more considered, more political. And in the end, he was a character that demanded his own television series. He had so much to say. Yeah. The three-minute bites that they gave him on Three of a Kind and on my sketch show weren't Wasn't enough. Wasn't enough, yeah. Um, and I did a, I did a half-hour film called What a Country <laughs> about um, a Windrush guy coming over to Britain, to the Midlands. And Stan Hay and Andrew Nichols, who wrote that... Um, I was really moved because they came to mom, my mum's house mm. and they talked to my mum about what it was like when she came to Britain and they showed such sympathy and empathy yeah. that I thought, well, they should write Delbert because Stan is always at the bookies and Andrew's a bit of a white boy and they're not black, but, but I am. But they get it. I yeah. am. And I thought, well, they talked to my mum, they know me, I can probably help. And my brother Paul helped as well. Mm -hmm. And between us, we all did Delbert. But they wrote it, and yeah. I loved doing that. Oh, he was, was where did such, the laugh come from? It, well, I, I had a car journey with a guy called Kelvin, who was a choreographer. It was literally like this. People ask where the characters come from all the time. Kelvin had a slightly camp air about him, and he, would dri he was driving the car like this. <laughs> and he, he couldn't pronounce his effies, and he was a choreographer. Yeah. And he danced to jazz funk all the time. Yeah. And he would drive, 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 <laughs> and then he'd say, you know what I mean? 
waiting for no reason at all. <laughs> he just kept saying, you know what I mean, even when he didn't mean anything. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was very amused. I had three hours, and by the end of it, I was talking like it as well. Yeah. You and I just like... thought it would be great to devote that to something. Yeah. So when the Brixton riots happened and there were no... Voices. You know, when they talk about leaders and voices, you know, mm. who are our community leaders? Who is going to speak about this issue? I wanted somebody like Delbert to come out and say, I'll tell you what it's like. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what stop and search is like, Giza. Mm. It's like this. Mm. And so Delbert became this voice, somebody who could articulate these feelings. Yeah. And um, I love it now. I, lo- I love that. When I look at that, I go, yeah, that was a fair stab at that. It really was. Now, your career has been so broad. Before we get to the present day stuff, I kind of want to talk more about your journey, um, you know, from stand-up to comedy acting and right through to, you know, serious acting, which is what you're doing now. Uh. So in the sort of early days to the mid part of your career, which characters or which roles really sort of encapsulated who you are as a man? Um, I was a mimic first, so I was sort of anything I saw, I wanted to emulate. I wanted to emulate. Mm. So when I was a kid, I loved watching. Uh, we watched television, only three channels. So I watched Mike Yarwood, who was a brilliant impressionist. I watched Eric and Ernie, mm. who were effortless comedians. I watched Some Mothers Do Have Them. I watched all the things that you watched. I watched all the cartoons, all the Hanna Barbara cartoons. I sort of, I worshipped Mel Blanc, who did all the voices for the Hanna Barbara cartoons. Um, and so I copied that. And then in, in the, as I got older, um, I sort of hear I worshipped Tarrant on Tiz Was. Did you really? Well, because he just seemed to not breathe <laughs> when he was doing live television and I didn't know how he was doing it. <laughs> he seemed to have no fear in him at all. Mm. And I was, I was terrified of being on television live. Uh, and the first two years I thought... When I was doing New Face, I'd prepare a three-minute bit, and then I would learn it and recite it. But on Tiz Wars, I wasn't required to do that. You it to took me quite it. a yeah. long time to learn what the requirements were. Yeah. And I think what, I've got, what I got better at was learning that, okay, different strokes for different stro- strokes, different, different mindset for different projects. This project, you've got to be loosey-goosey. Mm. This project, you've got to really prepare. So if you're doing a stand-up tour, you have to take a lot of time and prepare that and write it. But if you're going on live television, it can be more loosey-goosey and yeah. more anecdotal. Yeah. And Tiz Was meant that you could be very, very free. Mm. So you could have an idea, but you could explore that idea. On air. On air. Yeah, as it was happening. As it was happening. Yeah. And if it wasn't funny, you got bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, but we, got, we got to a point, point where it was pretty good. And... Uh, and we were only making... If we made Chris laugh, it was a success. Because right. he was the exec producer. Are you and Chris still friends? Um, I went to 70 the other day. Oh, wow. Is he, he 70 now? I had to represent for diversity. Yeah. <laughs> Happens a lot it's in your world, just me and the Phantom it? Flan figure, yeah. the only black people in the place. <laughs> Story of your life, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk um, a bit about your charity work. Uh, and comic relief. And really, in the early days, you were such an instrumental voice in terms of making the idea of celebrities in this. Because in America, people were so used to that. But here, it was kind of a relatively new uh, phenomenon. Where and I think it was good that we were new as well. We were yes, new to it. Yeah. Um, the thinking was that we were all communicators because we told jokes and we acted in funny things. So therefore, we must be able to tell somebody else's story. Mm. Um, and there were different times, you know. I mean, I, I, I often look at what we used to do to what we're moving towards slowly now. Mm. Um, we still took the pointy end of the documentaries. Yeah. So they put us in a situation. We were given scripts to set up the situation, to link it through, to interview people, and then to back ref and sum up. And so it was still a very traditional setup mm. when we started. And it was a long time ago now mm. uh, where we could say 21 of the poorest countries in Africa, 21 of the poorest countries in the world are in Africa. Are in Africa. Well, Which is not the case it's anymore. It's not the case anymore. No. So times have changed. And going forward, we are very aware of that. We're also very aware of the dominant culture. So, you know, I think the days are changing where it's just going to be a white person at the front saying, look at this, isn't it terrible? Look at the starving African people, isn't it awful? We're moving beyond that now, and we are moving to a stage where indigenous crew 
are being part of the storytelling narrative. They're telling their own stories. Mm. And I think this is a positive step forward. Um, one which I've advocated for a long time. A long time. Was... And, with the, and with the new CEO as well, I think she's very keen to change the way we Deep tell these stories yeah. and developing it in a way where people are included in their story. I'm always aware. I loved the Victoria Wood documentary where she went and stayed in somebody's house. I think it might have been in, in the Gambia where we knew everybody's name. Mm. We knew what mom did for a living. We knew what dad did for a living. We knew what the kids were studying at school. And people were part of their own story. Mm. And I think that if we're going to move forward into, the, into this 21st century of communication, of networking, of social media, we're in a place now where people are very capable of going, you know what, boom, here I am. Here's my story. This is what happened. Look at what happened. One of my, it was a terrible tragedy, uh, what happened in London last week. But there's an amazing shot on somebody's iPhone of a man running down the street with a pint, yeah. not spilling a drop. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's genius. That's how we roll in yeah. London, you get me? It, well, he was from Liverpool, actually, I know, that, that guy. You know, but yeah. in, the end, in the end, it was yeah. like, oh my God, <laughs> this is amazing. But amazing. you know, people, people are more than capable. And look at how many amazing filmmakers there are. Burkina Faso has its own film festival. Yeah. Why, aren't we, why aren't we keying into these amazing filmmakers that are indigenous and saying, help us tell the story. story. So that's where, we, I think that's the direction we're going to go in. Brilliant. It's going to be tricky, but we're going to do it. But it's important. Yeah. So with Comic Relief, was that your first experience making documentaries? I think I'd been, a, I think I'd been a participant in documentaries before. Um, I'd had, well, we're talking about 1988. Mm. So I'd had a South Bank show made about me. Okay. By Andy Harris. And then I pitched a funk documentary to Mel, Mel, Melvin Bragg. It was very funny. Hello. Want to do a documentary about f funk? He's like, what? Mm, what's that? <laughs> and, uh, and I sort of went, bunde, 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 <laughs> like that, and um, sang an Isley Brothers song. And he went, oh, okay, you can do that. <laughs> and, um, and then we, we went to America and shot this fantastic documentary where I got to pretend to be George Clinton or the Brothers Johnson or Bootsy Collins or something. Mm. Uh, interviewed Bootsy Collins in the uh, Wapping Bay Centre and Oof. he blew out every single speaker in the place. Wow. Uh, talked to George Clinton. George Clinton was exactly 24 hours late for his interview. <laughs> He's like, I turned up on time just the next day. Just the next day, baby. <laughs> it was brilliant. And uh, so my appetite for making docs was piqued by all this because I just thought, well, this is a, this is a good world. Mm. And it's very much like the Tiswas thing of irreverence and anarchy. And yeah, you've got some questions. Yeah, you've done the research. But if George shows up and he's got blue, pink, yellow and black dreadlocks, you've got to talk about that too. Yeah. And if he's smoked a joint and he's high as a kite, you've got to talk about that, that too. too. So I, I kind of got the idea early on that it was a more improvisatory um, milieu yeah. than what I was doing. And for me, as I was getting older, mm. stand-up became more and more cons constraining. Yeah. It, you know, most comedians have a plan and have written, even if it's bullet points, some comedians write it all out. Most comedians have a plan. I'm one of the f former. You know, so when you're, when you're in a room writing out every single joke and working out the funny of it all, it's quite a constraining yes. thing. Um, whereas docs were... Just loose fluid, yeah. And, and a much more comfortable place to play. Do you miss stand-up? Uh, he was very good at it, wasn't he? Very. I was all right. You all right? <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't miss that aspect of it. And I, I love this. My favourite thing is Q&A now. I like mm. talking to people. Okay. I've realised that I like talking to people and I'm curious. I like, mm. I, I, I sort of, I'm more willing to listen to other people now. I think when you're a comic, you want to do your thing. You want to do what you've practised and what you know works. Yeah. Whereas as a documentary maker, uh, as Nick Broomfield said earlier, you're like this, going, come on, man. Mm. And I love that. Mm. Well, we have a little clip of you in Comet Relief, so let's go back in time a little. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the things there is, I don't think you actually get enough credit for the fact that it was your idea to put it on television. So the comic relief that we're all so used to and we've been watching for the past 30 years wouldn't have existed if you hadn't suggested that. Well, we, we'd done... Richard had, because of Richard's reaction to um, a, quite a tough 
tough experience in Ethiopia. Mm. He'd organized all the comedians to come together. So Richard absolutely masterminded that thing and led from the front with of that. Of course. But um, there were lots of moments after where quite a lot of comedians came to my house or Richard's house or somewhere and we'd just talk about what we wanted to do. And this, it's, a very, it's a very producerial world now, Comic mm. Relief. Comedians are not necessarily the arbiters of their own fate as far as Comic Relief is concerned. Producers plan the evening, work out what the segments are, and then the comedians are brought in to fit into mm. each segment. Whereas back in the day, we just talked about, it would be funny if, uh, if uh, uh, Doctor Who showed up in uh, Fools and Horses. <laughs> and you know, then he did. We'd have, stupid, <laughs> we'd have conversations like that. Very much blue-skying ideas, yeah. blue-skying things, like in an improvisatory, anarchic way, and with a lot of comedians in a room. Everybody's trying to top each other. Yeah. And sometimes the cream would rise to the top and Richard would go, that's a good idea. Mm. And my, my thing, I might have been a bit pissed, but my thing was, we should be, we should be on telly. Why isn't it a long night of the telly? Why don't we all just do this thing on the telly? And I, I, you know, and I, 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 just, I had this idea of, you know, and I, we haven't really, start at seven o'clock and everybody gets a bit to do and you get to do your, your funniest stuff and you get to link to documentaries, and, and maybe it. And I had this thing of the lunatics take over. We've still not done this really, but at midnight, it gets wilder and crazier, and it goes on, mm. and it should be a, a, a completely immersive 24 hour experience. Yeah. Um, and we've never quite done that the way I wanted to do it. I, I basically wanted it to be like Saturday Night Live from midnight onwards. Yeah. And um, we've never done that because I think it, there are cost issues, and there are do they really want to hand over? The night to that, and we've got, and that to, got to deal with the won't news. That probably won't raise as much money, because it's a different audience. It'd be fun though. It'd be fun, so much fun. <laughs> I'd pay. Um, so let's talk about your theatre acting career. Yeah. So, what made you decide to branch from comedy, television? It started with a documentary. Big stage. It started with a documentary. Um, I've done a lot of work with Radio Four mm. with a fantastic guy called well, many people, but. Um, the key figure at Radio 4 for me is a guy called Simon Elms. Okay. He's a fantastic BBC guy. He says sorry for everything. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Lenny. Uh, you opened the door. Sorry. Uh, I've opened the door. Sorry. Would you like a cup of tea? Sorry. <laughs> Shall I get you a sandwich? Sorry, Lenny. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. He, he doesn't realise how lovely he is. He just keeps apologising for everything. And um, I just said I want to do a thing called What's So Great About? And uh, yes, okay. Well, what, sorry, what would it be about? <laughs> and I said, would it be about me not understanding why things are as revered as they are? Mm. And let's start with Shakespeare, you okay. know, because for me, Shakespeare was always this thing of middle class white people with a cabbage down their tights, <laughs> lisping. And um, <laughs> Richard Pryor kind of did this thing about Shakespeare. He says, Shakespeare would be like, how fee thy for thy fiveth. <laughs> Thank myself and for the fall. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and Shakespeare never had people from the Midlands in it or from Yorkshire in it, as far no. as I was concerned. Uh-uh. It was, it was, Not uh, many people from no, Dudley. it was the winter of our discontent. <laughs> My glorious summer of Odyssey, son of York. It was never that. <laughs> It was always posh people, and I just thought, it's not for me. Mm. It's not for me, mm. and therefore that door <laughs> closed. Yeah. And Simon said, let's do, let's do something called Will and Len, mm. subtitle, What's So Great About Shakespeare? Mm. And I met the great and the good. Holy crap. They all wanted to talk about why I should be in Into a position, to, why I should reconsider my position about Shakespeare. And I talked to Judy Dench and mm. Trevor Nunn, mm. and Peter Hall, and Patterson Joseph, and Adrian Lester, and Barry Rutter. And the turning point was Barry Rutter, because Barry Rutter rang me up in the studio because he couldn't come down because he was rehearsing. And he said, Shakespeare's for all of us. I'm from Hall. My dad was a fisherman. Your dad worked in a factory. We're working class. Our parents voted Labour. Why isn't Shakespeare for us? We can do what we fucking like. Blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you what. He just went on and on and on and on. And then he said, oh, for a muse of fire. And then he went into it. And it was like rock and roll. It was like Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. It was like the Sugar Hill Gang. Yeah. It was like Kate Tempest. And he didn't do it posh. He did it in Hull. Yeah. I went, oh, my God. That's, that's for me. brilliant. <laughs> and that, a documentary did that. And it changed my life. And I went, okay, mm. okay, let's do some more. So I talked to Adele when we were talking about Bob Dylan. Mm. Why, is it, why is Bob Dylan important? I talked to Brian Ferry. Mm. I talked to 
all sorts of people about Shane McGowan and the Pogues. Why are the Pogues important? I went to meet the Dubliners. That's a really weird experience. <laughs> Being a black person, talking to the Dubliners. Because, you know, back in the day, if, if there was a black person walking down the street in Dublin, it was usually me. <laughs> so for me to be talking to the Dubliners was bizarre. But they, they seemed to want to talk to me and they wanted to show why Shane was important and I didn't get Shane and then I got him and then I met him and, he, and, I, and I fell in love with him and I fell in love with his lyricism and his artistry mm. and so documentary can do that and so when I, when I go in I go in thinking one thing and my takeaway yeah. is what usually my documentaries when I make them it's they, they, sometimes they're about things I love and I go in as a fan and then hopefully I learn more but they're almost better if I go in having to be convinced about yeah, something. Yeah. And that's when they work for me. Yeah. That's when I go, oh, okay. Ooh. And the, 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 the Shakespeare thing was Barry Rutter and Judy Dench, who's a fantastic person, who spoke verse like she was just talking to you as your friend. And um, she read a sonnet and she just oh. sounded like it was a mate of yours. Just velvet. Telling you something yeah. really important. And it was understandable. And it was like being hypnotised. I was in a trance talking mm. to her. And I went out and bought her some candles. <laughs> I love you. Can I be your guilty secret? <laughs> she said no. There's still time, Lenny. There's still time. And so that experience moved you so much that it actually made you want to actually participate in Well, the second documentary about Shakespeare mm. was a participatory one for me. Okay. Because Addison Joseph and Peter... Peter Hall and Trevor Nunn said, you're not going to figure it out until you get the words in your mouth, mm. until you understand what the words mean. mean. And I said, okay, I'll, let me try it. So Barry Rutter and I went into a, a basement with Simon. I'm sorry, I'm going to be holding a boom. Sorry, is that in your way? Sorry, Lenny, sorry, Barry. <laughs> um, lovely Simon Elms had the boom and the, the grundig. And Barry and I rehearsed the, first, the last 14 lines of the pl of Othello, mm. um, and it was because Othello's about a black guy, and Barry thought it'd be a good idea. And well, mm. you know, well, you're not going to do Richard the Third, are you? You'll do Othello first if you're going to yeah, do anything. You're going to do anything. Because he's a black guy. Yeah. You, you know, you I'm know about well. that stuff, don't yeah. you? <laughs> You've um, done that in real life. Yeah. So, uh, so I said, okay. So we went into a basement, at broadcasting house, and um, there's me in a basement with these two guys, and we're doing soft you a word or two before you go. I have done the state some service and they know no more of that. And um, we do it for two and a half, three hours. And when you're doing comedy and you're in a room with two writers talking about why is this funny, why is that funny, it can get old and you run away and get sweets and coffee and croissant to make the journey easier. Mm. But I didn't want to leave that room it was so creative. It was so invigorating. It was so exciting. Wow. And Barry's enthusiasm was such that it, it pressed a button in me that made a light bulb come over my head. And I thought, why haven't I been doing this all the time? Yeah. Because he, he got up, he explained things. He, right, you're going to be there on the bed, this bit, right. You're going to be, you, you're there, you're, you're a fellow, yeah. I'm the blow. So we all come in like this. Everybody comes in. Now, there's a knife here. There's going to be a knife hidden somewhere on the set. Now, you're on the set, right. I'm over here. I'm one of the, you know, it was like that. And I was like, and basically, I'm 12 years old. Yeah. I love playing. And I'm watching this 70-year-old man playing. Do you remember when your mum and dad were, where are you? I'm playing. Do you remember that? Yeah. Remember if anybody asked you what you've been doing all day? You couldn't tell playing. them, could you? Playing, yeah. I'm playing. <laughs> so I'm watching Barry Rutter play in this room. And because he was playing, because his approach was, well, he's a player, we're going to play. I kind of thought, this is allowing me to participate mm. in this process. Mm. And so my, so in a process that you had originally thought wasn't for you. Wasn't for me. Yeah. So suddenly, I'm playing at being a fellow, and it doesn't feel alien to me. And I was incredibly moved by that. I was incredibly moved by that experience. And I'd never, ever rehearsed anything, let alone 14 lines. I'd never rehearsed 14 lines of anything for four and a half hours. And not gone, yeah, we've got that. 
Mm. Do you know what I mean? When you yeah. do, when you do, if I'm doing Delbert and I've done it, I, I rehearse it for four and a half hours. I'm like, want to shoot myself in the head. <laughs> but with this, I just thought, no. And every time we ran it, I learned something else about it. Yeah. Oh, he's self-justifying. Mm. Oh, he, he's. It's like he's been through a cosmic cloud of depression and weirdness, mm. and now he's out the other end. Oh, everybody's dead on this bed. Christ, how must that be? Okay, he's going to kill. This is like a suicide note. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, suddenly all of these things occur to you. The more you peel the layers from the onion, the more you mm. get to the nub of what this character's doing. And it, it's, it was just an extraordinary experience. And at the end, I said, do you think I can do this? And he said, yeah. And so the third documentary was shot, was done during rehearsals of my first ever experience of doing a live theatrical play. I'd never been on stage in a play before. And Simon, I'm sorry, Lenny, was there to capture the whole thing. All my insecurities, all the rehearsals. Yeah. Apparently, um, when, we did, when we did the read-through of the play, which I worked very hard on, mm. um, Barry said, uh, apparently, when um, Laurence Olivier did the stage, uh, did the read-through for Othello for the first time, he'd put so much work, work into it that A, he'd learnt the lines and he did, he did such a consummate reading that uh, the entire cast and crew gave him a standing ovation. I'd like to thank Lenny for not doing that today. <laughs> now let's get on with it. <laughs> and um, he, kept, he kept on at me all the way through that you're going to be a general at the end of this. You're not a general now, but you'll be a general at the end of it. And he really went on at me and mentored Did me. Did you believe that? No. 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 But by the end of it, it was a, a transformative experience and it changed my life. Mm. It literally stopped me thinking like... A comedian yeah. and it made me listen more yeah. and I think that the process of making documentaries the process of being curious the process of this idea of being patient made me more patient with that creative process than if I'd been Lenny the comedian Lenny yeah. Johnny goes too far Lenny let's find the knob gag instead I was this Len I was wearing glasses Len I was listening Len I was let's do some research Len and did it put it put you even sort of deeper in touch with the real Len. Yeah. Yeah. Because my mum always said... You're smart. You're much cleverer than you think you are and mm. you should... You must... You didn't say it like this, but you must continue your education so that you've got something to fall back on. Yeah. And I was an idiot and didn't do what she said. And then when she passed away, I thought, I think I'm going to pursue my education. Yeah. And now I can afford it. Yeah. You know, I don't know how young people afford their education now because of the cuts and stuff. But I, I as a, so a working comic, I can afford, to, can afford to do the Open University for six years. Well, so I did. Well, we're going to get to that in a moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit first uh, about Danny and the Human Zoo, <laughs> which was a really personal story for you. Uh-huh. So well, it was, well, it was, a, it was, it was about a personal your life, story. isn't it? Yeah. Ish. Yeah, it was about my life ish. We should have called it ish. Ish. Because, because <laughs> my life ish. I was given the creative freedom to do anything I want as long as it resembled my life in some shape or form. And when I wrote the original scripts, because it was meant to be a four, four one hours, I wrote four one hours about a, a musician called Danny in Dudley mm. who was a, you know, who could play any instrument and had these three white friends and had a mentor and had people who believed in him who were trying to help him. And it was about how he was discovered and how he had a career and how that affected his life with the people in, in his hometown of Dudley and all that kind of stuff. And Neil Gaiman read all the scripts. Neil, Neil's a kind of mentor of mine. And he said, what, what is it? why is it this? Why have you done this? And I said, because I don't want to tell my story. He said, ah, mm. but your story is more interesting than this. Mm. Why isn't he a comedian? He said, just make, make him a comedian and then lie about everything else. And I went, what do you mean? He said, well, just make it up. He said, I've written a story where it's definitely about me as a seven-year-old boy. He said, but I've made up a story around it. Why don't you just do that? And I literally went home and went, <laughs> like Angela Lansbury at the beginning of Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> and I wrote, this, I wrote a very fast draft of this story and it didn't really change very much from that draft, really. And... Um, it was very personal. Yeah. And I put a lot of myself into it. Because the but I changed names and I conflated characters and I did not tell the utter truth about some things. I, fantas I fictionalized quite a lot of it. But the, the only thing that got me into trouble with everybody 
was the stuff about my birth father. It, that's because, true, because right? The, because the man that raised me was not my birth father. My birth father, I didn't have much of a relationship with. And I basically told that story. Yeah. And... Um, but you found I, out I, later I, in life that... But creativity that is extraordinary wasn't. because when you're writing something... Mm you put a lot of yourself into it. Without realising. Without realising. Yeah. So whatever genre you're writing in, you're writing sci-fi or a dystopian future or, or a 19th century or something, but you're, you're basically spilling your guts about how you feel about that subject and you're including everything you know. You'll use everything you know to make that script have some very similitude. So if we talk about the character, so basically what happens to the character is that he's raised by one man who he believes to be his father. And then he finds out that his finds out birth father is, is somebody someone else. else. And, and that it, happened to you. And that happened to me, yeah. And but it didn't happen like it happened in the film. No. Are you sure? But then, but then as, yeah, and then as, but then as soon as the Daily Mail saw the film, mm. they started to ask questions about it and, yeah. and bother my family and they... Uh, was your mum alive? When no, you did no, that? no, 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 no. Well, you couldn't write this unless everybody was dead. Yeah, yeah. So I, and then, but unfortunately, my family were affected by it. So, mm -hmm. in many respects, but I did send it to all of them. All my brothers and sisters read, <laughs> read the script and went, "Oh, you're going to do this." <laughs> okay. Was, was much of, okay. <laughs> like, you want great. to talk about this? Oh, good. good. All right. So you watch how it go and bite you on the backside. <laughs> So just to touch on the personal a little bit. So when you found that out, did that change the relationship with your father who had raised you? Ah, that's a Daily Mail question. N not necessarily. No, my f the father who raised me is the father I talk about when I do stand-up. Right. So all of the things about the taciturn man who, who looks like the Daily Mirror with arms and legs, that's mm. the father that raised me. Mm. The father that said, um, where are you going? I'm going to the discotheque. Discotheque cafe clothes. I'm going to your bed. Yeah, that's the father. That's the father that raised me. <laughs> um, I go and beat your backside. That's the father that the father that looked at you like this, and where you didn't do anything. You know, that's the father that raised me. Mm. And the other the other guy who was the the guy who liked to drink, who was the dancer, who was the flirtatious. Cool guy, who yeah. was, that's the other guy mm. who I didn't have much to do with. Mm. But my relationship with him is very different to the one you saw. In the um, sure. in the film, okay. because I didn't. Re I still think that there are some things that you. Let's say making a documentary, but there's some things you don't want to share with the. View. I, not everything belongs to the public. At yeah, home. that's fine. It's got to be your interpretation yeah. or your choice to make those decisions of what you show. And because I'm a writer and I wanted to show, show my work. Mm. I wanted to show that I, you know, I was given the opportunity to make a film, and I was yeah. really and I got to work in. Destiny Ekaraga, I, I was able to say, be great if there was a BAME director. And suddenly, Destiny walked in and she got what it was all about. She was very moved by the script and wanted to do it her way. And I was really chuffed by that. Brilliant. She's great. Well, we very, have very a talented. clip, so let's <gasps> look at it. Yes. Oh, is this the, by the canal? Yeah. Oh, this is when Dad's telling Danny about his relationship with his mum and about what his mum is like. Mm-hmm. Lovely. Lovely. That's what it was like. Yeah. Wow. So, let's talk about your work in diversity. You want to talk about that? Let's talk more about <laughs> Oh, we just talked about it. Yeah, we can talk no, more right. about no, no, it. You don't, you no, no, it's, it's, it's very self-evident what, it, what that is. Mm. But it's, um, like I say, when you're writing, you don't know you're writing. And I think, because... because my, my, the father that raised me died in 1977. Mm. I never had a chance to have that conversation. Oh, wow. So I got to write it. Yeah. And I think yeah. um, that thing of no tears in the writer, no tears in the, in the screenplay, mm. no, no laughter in the writer, no laughter in the, mm. That's very, very true. Mm. Um, you've got to write what moves you, yeah. otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. And I think I, I try and do that with every, everything I write now. And also, as a viewer, like <laughs> <laughs> oh, me, my story. And as a viewer, you can't help but be moved by that. I hope so. Yeah, well done, you. So we talk about diversity. Yeah, you've done lots in that area, haven't you? So what? So I'm going to ask first of all. So with you, in terms of diversity, the first part of your career, your work in the area of diversity was being there, was being on screen, was being in the room, being visible. 
And then at this part of your career, you've become a real campaigner and you have really made this your mission in having conversations that not everybody wants to discuss. So why did you decide to do it? I didn't have a meeting mm. with anybody that looked like me in the whole of your career. For pretty much nearly all of my career as a comedian. Wow. So for 30 something years, I would walk into a room and there'd very few women, but there'd be rarely anybody that looked like me in the room, ever. And um, you know when they do a, a, a company shot at the end of a shoot? Yeah. So I'd do these films like Coast to Coast or Alive and Kicking or, <laughs> or um, Delbert or Bernard and the Genie or um, Lenny Henry Tonight or whatever. We'd do a company shoot and it was always the same picture. There'd be me and if, the ca if there were black people in the cast because, of, because the story demanded it, yeah. there'd be the people in the cast at the front. But then the people that made the show and made the decisions about what, what was in the show were always the same kind of people. Now, I've got no beef with that because for many years, that was the status quo. Um, but after a while, particularly after my experience as a producer with crucial films, mm. and, and where I said, I used to say in meetings, oh, it'd be good if this was a kind of... A, multi-ethnic production or something. Could it be more ethnically diverse, this show? Mm. It'd be nice to see some... Are there any black sound men, I'd say, in meetings? Um, when I was doing Chef, are there any black cinematographers? Can we... And um, holy crap, you'd walk onto the set and Remy Adifarasan's there. Or Keith's there. Or whatever. And you kind of go, oh, you're really good at your job. Why haven't I seen you before? And they go, well, you asked, you asked for it to be an ethnically diverse set and they had to find somebody... <laughs> So I think that, I keep saying it comes from the top. Mm. It comes from the people who are deciding. And if the people, Pat Young calls them, the pickers and deciders, if the pickers and deciders are always of the dominant culture, mm. it's going to be very difficult to effect change. Because mm. unless you've got a seat at the table, you can't have decisions like that imposed upon a production. Yep. And um, one of the problems with... Ofcom's decision not to regulate the BBC or the independent sector, not to regulate who's behind the scenes, is that we're never going to know who's making these shows. We're going to always show up at things and go, oh, okay, it's the same. Unless we are duty-bound to write down the ethnicity and the gender makeup and the sexuality and, class. and the class yeah. of where we're from Disability, and everything. All of and it. just because this election proved that without data we're nothing. Mm. You know, we had one day of skill set telling us about how BAMEs were leaving the industry, of how people were hitting a glass ceiling, of how people were not moving forward in their careers because of the move to Salford or whatever. Um, and one day of people taking a litmus test of one day. Imagine if they had to do that every day on every production and, they, and somebody fed it into a computer and what would happen? Jesus Christ, it would blow your mind. So what we're asking for is for Ofcom to actually get to regulating. Hmm. It's their job to regulate and it feels like they're not going to do that. And also... If they're going to have this thing, whatever, I can't remember what it's called now. It was called Silver Mouse. What's it called now? It's called the um, Diamond. Yeah. Thing, isn't it? The diamond Are we going to have that? Yeah. It's, like, it's like they're deliberately not implementing it because people don't want to do it. And it's such a simple thing to do. You know, you know what I'd do if I had a production company or if I was running an independent or whatever? I'd just look out my office door and see what it's like out there. I'd just look out and go, oh, okay. <laughs> if, it, if it ain't variegated, get aerated. <laughs> I'd so why do you think diversity is important? It's important because... Because there are still good shows being made. Yeah, there's, listen, be... that's not going to change. Mm. But what's interesting is that there are creative people in all walks of life, and if people aren't included in the, in the narrative conversation, mm. um, you're not going to get those great ideas. Yeah. Jamal Edwards literally went round all his mates and filmed them because they all wanted to rap, and now he's got an empire. Yeah. You know, the idea that talent isn't out there, that 
that BAMEs have nothing to contribute to this huge creative cultural conversation is a misstep. And a great loss. And, and a great loss. Community. And if you yeah. don't include people in this conversation, you're missing out. Yeah, big time. Big time. Big time. And so it's time for a change. And going forward, I see inclusion as the way forward. Uh -huh. Because you want somebody who goes, well, my mum used to do this, or my dad used to do this, or my family, or when I was at school, I experienced this. Or why don't we try this idea? Because if you don't do that, you're not going to get your Steve McQueen's or your Amara Santis. Yeah. You're not going or to your Lenny Henry's. <laughs> so I, I think inclusion is the <laughs> yeah, way forward. I think Unity so. is the way forward. Youth is the way forward. Being groovy, being gender fluid, being funky is the way forward. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Why not? Let's do it. Let's, do Let's it. stop having diversity be about a brown person in a room depressed. <laughs> Let's invite those Present people to things like this and have them be part of it. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to ask you one last question, then we'll take a couple questions from the audience. Oh, they're going to say stuff. Yeah, before we wrap up. Cool. Um, so... Let's talk about your PhD because you were saying you wanted to go back to school and make your mother proud. You, you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell I me about that. did a PhD that. like I've got time. Like you've got time. It's, oh. been, it's been a real struggle, actually. What is it called? I was called? doing it full time and I wasn't doing it full time. Okay. I told him I was doing it full time. But you weren't. No. No. I, I, I lied. He was acting, <laughs> directing. I was, I was acting. I was in the syndicate. I was doing a stand up tour. I was, I was, I was raising a child. It yeah. just wasn't. No. So I had to go part time. And um, it was very, very difficult. difficult. And I quit three or four times. And then everybody, including my producing partner, Barbara Emile, who's sitting over there, said, you can't give up. Because if you give up, what's, what message is that? Mm. For people who think that you're something. You know? yeah. Why don't you just do it quietly? And if you need help, ask for help. So I, <coughs> I did a thing. I, there's Amanda Palmer, who's married to Neil Gaiman, does this thing about... It's cool to ask for help, you know. It's all right. If mm. you're struggling, ask for help. Mm. And I just thought, yeah, actually, why don't I just say to my tutors, help me. Mm. And so they did. They were brilliant. And um, <coughs> my female tutor, Sue Clayton, just said, let's work together for a week on this. And so we had a week where we worked together every day. And my male tutor, John Hill, just said, come and see me and we'll work together. And then I had a supernumerary tutor who helped me with expressing my ideas and between us it taught me that nothing happens solo no everything is teamwork. It's teamwork yeah and i just thought this is like it's literally like making a documentary where everybody mucks in and says why don't you think about this it's not the writing because i can do that it's not the creativity because i can do that it's the idea of shaping your thoughts shaping the thought process and working out the direction and your thesis and once i started to understand that it started to come together like this. The last year has been a, a formation of the thesis, and it's been extraordinary. Oh, well. And it's, all be, and it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been an act of listening and an act of curiosity and an act of collaboration, and for that I'm thankful. Can you tell me quickly about Lenny's Got Blues as well? That was just me wanting to meet people. and All your favourite musicians. All my favourite musicians. <laughs> a lot of documentaries for me are like that. You know, the fun, the hunting, the fun, hunting the Funk was, can I get to meet George Clinton and James Brown? And I got to meet James Brown, although I still don't understand the interview. <laughs> oh, good God. When I started off. <laughs> good God. How? <laughs> good God. Good that was God. the interview. Yeah. <laughs> can I get a bag full of money? How? <laughs> We literally had to give him a thousand quid or something. <laughs> Good God. Lenny, I'm going to Melvin was loving that. Lenny, I'm going to interrupt you because I think we should quickly have a look at it. No, you do, do you want to or do you want to go to questions? Or? Why don't we see it? Because it's coming on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It. Oh, is this yeah. about Morrison? I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I does, love that. When does that air? It's been on. It's been on. It's been on. It was on back in the day, June. You missed it. I missed it. I can get you a DVD can you cheap. Please, yeah, to today. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I love that because he didn't realise we were filming at all. And he was just going for it. The Nick Broomfield it. thing of be rolling. I like that. Mm. I like you know. Often when I've made documentaries, there's a there's a kind of set. There's a sense of um, preparedness. I, I do like the preparedness and being brief and making sure you've done your homework. But I do love the idea of. Just go Be and, rolling. and see what happens. Yeah, because you get Ruby Turner combing her hair and talking about stuff and Jules Holland 
trying on a shirt and figuring out whether it's the right one. You get, well, speak, you get the good stuff. Speaking of B-roll, we're going to take probably about three questions. Let's take them at once, and then you can answer it all together. Okay, go for ahead. For the sake of time. So where's the microphone? We, we have a microphone? Okay, so we're going to take this lady here first. So microphone, if you go to her, and then gentleman there. So lady, if you go, get ready to go to him. And then there's a man there. Yep, go to him. And then I want a woman. Then we've got gender equality. There we are, you. Hello. Hi. So Hello. lady there after. I say, you're first. Hi. My one's an easy one. What was your PhD in? It's a, it's a media PhD. It's about screenwriting. Um, because every meeting I went to, there was this kind of assumed thing about writing. There's, with writers, it's very difficult. How do you know you're a writer? Um, how do you... How do you know it's any good? All that kind of stuff. And I just wanted to... I did an MA in screenwriting. And then I thought, well, I, I, I think I'd like to carry, on this, carry this further. So I, I, I made sure that at the centre of this PhD by practice, there was a screenplay that I developed over a, the whole length of making the PhD. And then there was work about that, about the development of the process. But there was also theory about writing and, about, um, and research about... British approach to filmmaking, American approach, and the world approach mm. to filmmaking. And I interviewed The Great and the Good, so documentary is part of that too. Um, an offshoot of that was Raising the Bar, which was on Radio 4, about the BAME um, contribution to arts in this mm. country. So it, it, anything that makes me think or that educates me is a, is a big win for me. So it became, everything became part of my PhD. Everything was my PhD Fantastic. at one point. And then I had to narrow it all down, which is why I think it was so difficult to nail to the floor. But at its, at its core was, the, was, the screen, was a screenplay. So everything was about me learning about narrative and about characterization and about tone and, uh, and the reasons why you write and, and basically nailing your ass to the seat and getting things finished, which seems to be the biggest issue. Wonderful. Gentlemen there? First and foremost... Um Hello, and thank you very much, Sir Lenny Henry, to come into Sheffield, yeah. a small city, which really, yeah, um, yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty small city, which doesn't really get a lot of, you know, media. It's you know, a beautiful attention. city. Great right here. I've, I've done gigs here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But my question is, like, I'm currently a student at Sheffield Hallam, and my question is, what message do you have for student and my generation within the 20s because unfortunately for my generation we have this perception of self-entitlement and the people <laughs> around us kind of want something like it's it's almost like we expect to be given something and that's the thing about our generation so what message do you have for filmmakers that are within that era and who just kind of want to actually achieve something but the people around have this perception of self-entitlement I, I think I have? think you've got to take control of your work. I think that um, watching Nick Broomfield earlier, what was very very interesting was this idea of um, the World Wide Web, mm. the internet, the the inspiration of Jamal Edwards. Of you you take it to the street if you want to make something, if you want to film something, and you know although although all the footage I've, I see on the news is always the wrong way round, it's almost like the, the people just go Aah! like that. They never film it like that. It's almost like everybody in the world needs to have a lesson from yes, Remy Adafarisan or somebody. Exactly what you need. Okay, to focus and yeah. framing a shot. Horizontally, Let's, please. You know, yeah. It's like a, so. But what I would say is, take control of your work and don't wait to be told to do something. You know, obviously learn the craft, but go out and start shooting as soon as you can. Start forming your opinions and your ideas. Start shaping your thoughts because it's going to happen sooner or later anyway, where you're going to be required to explain yourself. But don't be scared to steal. Don't be scared to show your work. Don't be scared to share your work. Form a gang. Stickiness is good. Yeah. When I was watching, um, I, was, I had a sketch show on BBC One, The Lenny Henry Show. Um, it was real lonely. So, you know, I got to work with Rick Mail and Ben Elton and Dawn and Jennifer and Robbie Coltrane, mm. but it was very lonely. Um, and then when I saw them on Channel 4 making the comic strip presents, I kind of went... Bearing in mind I'm a mimic. Oh, I want to do that. Because they're in a gang. Yeah. They're together. They're sharing, they're they shaping, they're writing, they're other. creating. And there was a buzz about them because they were sticky. Mm. Everybody wanted to work with them. There's a reason why all those impressionists kept painting pictures of food. It's because they were always eating together. Yeah. 
So get a group of you and start doing something. Start a movement. You know, Harlem Renaissance. It was a thing. Sheffield Renaissance. Sheffield Re- Renaissance. Bring it. Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, Harlem Renaissance. Yeah. Woo! Do it. Gentlemen there. Hello. Um, it's a pleasure watching you. Um, so over your career, you quite a long spanning career. You've seen a lot of cultural changes and political changes. And I was just wondering, what's your view and opinion on the current political climate in England with <laughs> Brexit, uh, Theresa May, <laughs> and Corbyn and a lot? I'm, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Lenny? Um, I'm gobsmacked by it all, aren't you? I, I just sat there. Did, did you sit there like this? I sat there like this. Well, I was late for my show. I was up all night and I was late for my... Nearly everybody in my show, which is um, at the Dunmar Warehouse, has one week left. Darling. Uh, Archero Ui, The Resistible Rise, a political allegory of Nazi Germany seen through the eyes of Chicago gangsters in the 30s. Uh, <laughs> five stars in the Telegraph. To um, <laughs> um, but I... I <coughs> You know, I think it's very difficult in this time to, to be a, a somebody who's in the public eye. Um, I think there has been an over-reliance on celebrity endorsement. I think that's got to stop. I think politicians got to politic and comedians got to comed. Mm. I think if you're a comedian and you want to give your opinion on stage, fine. But I think that the minute you find yourself on a platform with grown-ups, you've got you to kind of wait for a backlash. Um, because you know, I, I remember being part of Red Wedge and uh, we were all there w- with Neil Kinnock and, and I just remember thinking, what am I, I shouldn't be here really. This is, I felt like big people had made me do something. <laughs> and, um, but what's brilliant is everybody's been campaigning, feels like to me. Everybody's been trying to get young people to trigger, yeah. to initiate. And I think that's the big take yeah, away from that's that. That's the wonderful. The big win yeah. is that millennials aren't doing this self-entitled thing. Yeah. Millennials, young people are wanting to be involved. My daughter, my partner's kids um, are all relating to what's going on and are actually saying, oh, this is my time to say something. Now. Yeah. This is my time to take part. And I think that all of the work leading up to this election where young people are engaged with issues, are on social media, thinking about things, trying to understand what the issues are and having their own opinions are invaluable and I think that everybody that's made documentaries that's trying to make things that explain things they've done a fantastic job because now people are engaged and now we're going to see something yeah and even look what happened here I mean that that was the youth folk that did that so it's it's amazing the influence that the next generation is having on our politics great watching you're people change, on the platform change, you're literally head. changing this country <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. having surprised people doing that Scooby-Doo face of <laughs> Lovely lady here, final question. Um, hi, Lenny. I'm so glad I missed the Whitney Houston film to come Yay! and watch you. I really am. <laughs> I really feel I made the right choice. But I guess the question I have for you is, um, what skills do you, do you use to reach a universal audience? Oh, and, um, that's a great question. And what challenges have stand out the most um, due to your background? I don't, I'm not sure. Well, I think being a, a black comedian in the 70s was an extraordinary testing ground for me. I mean, there were, there were only a few of us. Me, Charlie Williams, Josh White, um, Sammy Thomas, and I think Kenny Lynch used to do stand-up too. And every time you went on stage, you were having to persuade and charm and seduce a white audience. Yeah. Every time you went on stage. Mm. And I think that stood me in good stead for every single job I did going forward. Um, nowadays, um, we, we often lead with our individual state, our minority status, our gayness, our blackness, our femininity, our whatever. We lead with it and we go, I want to make a program about this subject matter. And I think the thing is, what happens if you don't do that? What happens if you talk about the things that... Uh, just universal. Universal, mm. that, that bring us together, mm. unite us. Mm. You can still bring your personal point of view and your, your, 
you know, because what I found with Danny and the Yumazu is that you spill your guts about everything you create because it's always you. Mm. It's always Morgan Spurlock. It's always Reggie Yates. It's always me. It's always Michael Moore. But within the structure of talking about jail or drug addiction or whatever, it's always you. Mm. So what I learned, and John Peel, John Peel came to see me, and I, it was in Norwich, and a um, very rowdy audience with quite a lot of, there were some dodgy people in the audience who were saying things like, when's the coon coming on? Oh, God. And John Peel was shocked. When was this? This is back in the day. Okay. Um, 79, 80. And um, he said, your job was to not only convince them that you could do your job, but also to make them laugh in a way that made them feel comfortable with themselves. Now, now, I feel like well, it's not my business to make you feel comfortable. That's how I roll on stage. But actually, for a young person to do that without really thinking about it, that, I, 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 I literally look at myself when I was a young person and I go, Jesus, how did you get through that? Because mm. I, I have no idea how I would do that. I went on stage once and there were all these young, um, there were about 11 white guys in grass skirts with tribal makeup on, with spears on the front row of the audience. And I was shaking. Wow. And um, I think I said something and the security came and got them out. I, went on, I, went, I did a show once when I was in the toilet and some people came in and they said that they were going to have my head on a stick by the end of the show if I wasn't any good. Oh. I, I did a show once where, you know, and you, but you still have to go on. So what I think is this, my friend. I think... Learn, learn your craft, because I never learned my craft. It took me a really long time to get to a point where I could think, oh, well, I can do this. Learn, learn your craft so you're going in armed. They're not parachuting you behind the lines without any skills. You've got skills. You know about filmmaking. You know about sound. You know about subject matter and creating a thesis and a tone and, having, and shaping your thoughts. Learn all that stuff. And then do your very best to do the best work you can do. And Steve Martin says, be so good they can't ignore you. And that's universal, you know. Yep. And on that note, we definitely cannot ignore Seleni Henry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah.